<sighs> Hello, everybody. Okay, starting like one or two minutes late, just the time for me to get everything set up. Okay, so it's my uh, last two lectures this week and next week. So what I propose to do is send out the last microbe of the week question this evening at 7 p.m. Okay, and uh, next week we'll have the final scores and uh, the prizes, right? <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to go through this week and next week is an introduction to virology. And I've kind of changed the, uh, the organization around for these two lectures this year to try and keep more time for human viral infections next week. So what I will be doing today is giving a general introduction about viruses, what are viruses, uh, how do we study viruses, and the basics of uh, virus structures, and then look at bacteriophages, that is viruses that infect bacteria. And I'm going to try and finish this today, but you know, we might end up uh, just getting this far and we'll pick up here next week, okay? Right, so the first question is, what are viruses? And one of, please come in. Okay, what are viruses? And one thing that everybody has to be clear about is that viruses and bacteria are not the same thing at all. Now, what do I mean by that? So if you think back like 100 years ago, what was the definition of a virus in 1920? Then it would be something like this, you know, uh, a virus is a filterable infectious agent. So we can infect an animal or a plant. And if you take the infectious material, like the leaves of an infected plant, and you grind them all up, and you pass that material through a filter with a pore size that's small enough to block all bacteria, then the virus goes through the filter. So what does that mean? That means that the infectious particle is way smaller than a bacterial cell. And that was pretty much, you know, the definition of what a virus was 100 years ago, based on the physical size of the infectious particle. So that was pretty useful as a definition because it gave you some practical test that you could do and you would get an answer. Is it a virus? Is it uh, some other kind of microorganism? So it's very, very useful, but it doesn't tell you much about the biology or the characteristics of what viruses are, apart from they are small, it tells you that. So viruses were studied you know, first in bacteria and in animal models in the 19, well, the first half of the 20th century. And this was kind of the beginning of molecular biology and from the 1940s, it was possible to visualize virus particles by electron microscopy. So they started to become, to, to, started to be more and more information about the fundamental nature of viruses available in the 1950s. So André Lvoff at the Pasteur Institute tried to bring together what was known about viruses at that time in what was called the modern definition of viruses. So these are the, the different criteria that the Vlof uh, proposed as to what a virus is. So uh, he carried on with the criterion of size. So the infectious particle is less than 250 nanometers in diameter. So this is just saying the same kind of thing as this. Then when you look at particles, they have one type of nucleic acid, virus particles, RNA or DNA, but not both. And this was a fundamental difference compared to cells because any type of cell 
bacterial cell, human cell, plant cell. The genome is in DNA, and the cells also contain mRNA, rRNA, and tRNA. And that's true for any kind of bacterial cell, even a latent form like an endospore. And this is really a fundamental difference between viruses and cells. And then the other parts are a little bit about the biology of viruses. Okay, so uh, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They can only replicate inside a, a cellular host. They need a host because they don't carry their own enzymes for producing metabolic energy and they cannot produce their own proteins. And another thing that is very interesting is when you look closely, you can see that viruses do not replicate by binary division. So I'm going to look at a few of these criteria in a bit more detail. And one other thing that is also true, or was you can add, is that no virus codes for ribosomal RNA in its genome which is really very, a very surprising thing, because as we saw in the bacterial taxonomy, this is one of the most conserved molecules in the whole of the biosphere. Archaea, eubacteria, eukaryotes have all got ribosomal RNA. And so this is such a fundamental difference that there's a microbiologist at Pasteur Institute, Patrick Forter. He says that the history of life is a three or four billion year war between replicators who have got ribosomes, that is cells, and replicators that don't have ribosomes, which are viruses. Okay, so this is the, according to this view, is the fundamental difference between viruses and cells. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, criterion of size. So how big are virus particles? Now, most viruses are, have a diameter, you know, about 100 to 200, or maybe 40 to 50 nanometers diameter, up to about 150 nanometers diameter. So the smallest ones, they'll, they might have a diameter of only 20 nanometers. Now, once you get up to the pox viruses, you can see that this is pretty much pushing the limit of André Leboeuf's definition because this bar here is 200 nanometers in, uh, in length. So the whole thing is about 250 nanometers in diameter and a little bit longer. And in fact, since more recently, giant viruses have been discovered. So some viruses are in fact bigger than this. And also, there are other types of biological objects like this thing. So here the bar is 100 nanometers. So this is an object which has got a diameter less than 200 nanometers. Doesn't look very complex on the inside, but in fact, this is a type of bacterium. It's a mycoplasma. So this part of the Levoff definition isn't really um, sufficient to differentiate between the biggest viruses and the smallest bacteria. There's a bit of an overlap. Okay, so the next thing is viruses are obligatory intracellular parasites. That is true of all viruses, but it's also true for some bacteria. So Mycobacterium leprae, you know, causes leprosy. It cannot grow in a culture medium. It can only grow inside a host cell. And that's true for chlamydia and rickettsia as well. So these types of bacteria have become obligatory intracellular parasites. So related to that is the idea that viruses can't produce their own metabolic energy or their own proteins. Now, some intracellular bacteria produce their own ATP. You know, they eat stuff inside the cell and they produce their own ATP. Others actually don't bother. They just import ATP from the host cell. They have an ATP-ADP 
co-transporter, so they export ADP and they import ATP. However, all of the intracellular bacteria produce their own proteins on their own ribosomes, whereas all viruses require the host cell ribosomes to produce viral proteins. Okay, and the last thing that I want to look at again is this idea that viruses don't grow and divide by binary division. So if you think about any kind of cell, when the cell grows, you start with one cell, gets a bit bigger, gets a bit bigger, and then finally divides and you have two cells. Okay, that's binary division or budding, it's the same kind of thing. Now, you could imagine that perhaps viruses do the same thing. So you've got a virus particle, and when it's going to start to grow, it's going to get bigger and bigger, and then finally you'll get two virus particles. That would be the equivalent for viruses. In fact, that does not happen. What happens is that at some point in the viral infection cycle, the virus particle dissociates, and liberates the virus genome. Then what occurs is inside the cell, you get lots of copies of the virus genome, lots of copies of viral proteins, and then they associate to form new particles. So it's kind of like uh, building a kit out of bits of Lego or something. Okay, you've got all the parts, and uh, you build them together, and you make new, new virus particles. That's very different from what cells do to replicate and divide. It's really a fundamental difference, and that's true for all viruses, even the biggest ones with the most complex genomes. Okay, so uh, another thing that need, everybody reads, needs to remember is that viruses are everywhere. And I, as far as I know, whenever anybody has looked for viruses infecting a particular type of organism, you can always find some. So there are viruses that infect animals, viruses that infect plants, viruses that infect bacteria, viruses that inf inf infect insects and other invertebrates. Any type of cellular life is infected by viruses. So most of the time, you know, depending on your interest in biology, you'll be thinking about, you know, in medical science, people think about and concentrate on human viruses and might have a little bit of a tendency to forget that these other viruses exist, but you know, they, they are everywhere. Okay, so how can we study viruses? Because they are so tiny, you can't see them in the microscope. In the lab classes, tomorrow, you'll be able to see bacteria under the microscope. You can't see viruses. And because they are obligate intracellular parasites, you can't grow them in a culture medium. So, you know, these are, these are two kind of problems in virology. So in order to, you know, get some viruses to study them, every virologists need to have a system to produce and purify viruses. And then once you've done that, you can try and like grow them up, purify the virus particle, and then try and analyze them by some kind of physical chemical technique and find out what they are. Now, the other way to, 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 to study viruses is to try and analyze them in situ, which I, by which I mean inside infected cells, or inside infected organisms. So you might get a stock of purified virus that you got from here, then inoculate it into a cell culture or into an animal or a plant. And then at different time points, you'll take samples from your infected organism and try and find out where you have the different virus proteins, uh, where they accumulate, when, and uh, what kind of genes are expressed at different times in the affected cells and uh, when the rep virus replicates its genome. And then 
using this kind of approach, you build up an idea of how viruses replicate. Okay, so these kind of two complementary approaches that give you different types of information. This is what are viruses, what are they made of, what are their structures, and this is going to tell you how do they infect cells, how do they kill cells, how do they make us sick. Okay, so what production systems can you use? Well, the first ones were, of course, whole organisms. You know, Pasteur started studying the rabies virus before he even knew what a virus was. All he knew was that this thing doesn't grow in a culture medium. So, but I know it affects people's brains. So I'm going to try and get a brain from an infected person, mush it up and inoculate it into the brain of an animal. And it worked. You know, we could uh, uh, cultivate the virus from one animal to the next. So, you know, live animal inoculation, your virus will grow up in the organism and then you can extract it and uh, uh, maintain your virus stock. Also, same thing was true for plants. You can get infectious tissue from one infected plant, grind it up, and just you know, inoculate the plant and it will also get sick. So first studies were with whole organisms. And then it was really possible to start understanding how viruses replicated once there were simpler systems available. Okay, this is a whole organism getting infected, a lot of different processes going on. It's complicated. You have to break things down into a simpler system. And this is possible if you've got cells in culture. So, of course, the first system that existed like this were bacteria that microbiologists could cultivate. So, once you can grow bacteria, you can start growing the viruses that infect bacteria. So, studies of bacteriophage were very important in fundamental virology. And then, really, from uh, the end of the 1940s, cell culture became readily available and it was possible to study animal viruses in this kind of simple system. Okay, so you've got different production systems, you can grow your virus. Now, if you want to purify it, the classical technique is to use ultra centrifugation on a gradient of sucrose, uh, cesium chloride or other chemicals that form a density gradient. So you have the gradient here. So down here is very, very dense. So higher concentration of sucrose or cesium chloride, lower concentration up here. You put your raw extract containing viruses up here on the top. Then you put it in the centrifuge and you spin it really, really fast for overnight. What you often do. And what will happen is the virus particles, which are denser than a soluble protein, they'll be pulled down into the gradient and form a band where the density of the virus particle is the same as the density of the material that forms a gradient. Whereas the soluble proteins, they stay up in the top. Okay, so here's an example. Now, this is a density gradient. These virus capsid proteins have been labeled with a fluorescent molecule. So you can see uh, the bands here. That's me. So you've got your purified virus particle. So you've got the band of purified virus in a gradient. Then what you can do is look at the particles by electron microscopy. So this is data from a paper from a while ago now, but you can see you've got purified virus particles, so these are pox viruses, and then you can uh, analyze the different proteins in the virus particles by uh, gel electrophoresis, for example, and you can see that there are a lot of different proteins in these particles. So this is an unusual example. Most of the time in a virus particle, you'll have one, three, five, 
maybe 10 structural proteins in a virus particle. And this number of bands that you can see here is unusual. Okay. But you can see with this kind of technique, you apply it to all sorts of different viruses. Then you can see what kind of shape they have and how many different proteins there are in the virus particle. Okay, so once we can do that, you can start trying to classify different types of virus based on their morphology. So this was really the first thing that was done to try and classify different groups of viruses from the 1940s onwards, because electron microscopy, I think, was invented just at the end of the 1930s and became a uh, widely used in virology from about the 1950s. So for the first time, it became possible to actually see and visualize virus particles. Now, what do you see? Well, first thing is that, you know, virus particles really fall into two categories. They are either non-enveloped or naked virus particles, and they are formed by the genome on the inside, RNA or DNA, surrounded by a protein coat called the capsid. And capsids can have two different types of symmetry, helical, so you get particles which are rod-shaped, or icosahedric, which gives kind of spherical particles. And bacteriophage often have a kind of mixture of these two elements, an icosahedral head and a helical tail. This is a bit of a Bad translation from French, I'm afraid. So, icosahedral, it should be in English. <coughs> now, the other main type of virus particle are enveloped particles. So, what you have here, you've got genome capsid, so a nucleocapsid on the inside, and it's surrounded by a lipid envelope, which is derived from one of the host cell membranes. And what you can see is that either well, what you can see. So envelope viruses are called either simple or complex. If they're simple, that means you've got one of these two different types of nucleocapsids on the inside and just with an envelope on the outside. And complex virus uh, envelope viruses, well, you know, it's, it's more complicated. So this is a pox virus again. It's got this kind of double membrane structure and the part in on in the middle on the inside doesn't really correspond to either a spherical capsid or a, or a helical capsid. Now, many virus families have, uh, were named because of the way they look in electron microscopy. So, you know, coronaviruses, you know, they've got a crown of the spike protein around the outside of the particle. Uh, Calici viridae, so these look like a kind of chalice, apparently, you know, the, and arena viruses. Okay, this is not like two guys in armor trying to kill each other. I mean, it's apparently because the inside of it looks sandy, like arena is sand. Okay, so, and also, you know, some, of, some viruses have got a very, very specific morphology. So anybody who looks at this can say, oh, that's a pox virus. If you look at this kind of thing here with an envelope virus, looks like a kind of bullet or something, this is a rhabdovirus. Very, very typical morphology. So it's useful, you know, electron microscopy was useful for, you know, grouping viruses into families and identifying them. Okay, so let's have a little bit of a closer look at the two types of capsid uh, uh, architecture. So the simplest one is uh, helical symmetry. Now, okay, so the basic function of the capsid, especially for non-enveloped viruses, is just to protect the genome. If you're a virus, at some point you've got to go from one infected cell and leave that cell and go outside and infect another cell. If you just have your RNA or DNA, you know, outside the cell, these molecules are 
sensitive to enzymatic attack, to chemical attack. So the fundamental function of the capsid is to protect the genome by covering it up. So basically the idea, or the basic idea with a helical capsid is, you know, you've got your nucleic acid, RNA or DNA, it's a long linear molecule, right? So what you can do is you can just get a protein that forms a helix and it will wind around the nucleic acid all the way like this and cover everything up. And this nucleic acid will be protected. So that's basically what happens for a tobacco mosaic virus. The capsid protein on its own will form this double ring structure. I think there's 17 copies in each ring. Then this will interact with the genome, which is RNA. That interaction pushes the two rings out of alignment. So you have a free face here for the, for the addition of extra subunits. So the subunits will start to add on here and then the capsid will get longer and longer and longer until there's no more RNA left. And in the end, you get this kind of stick-like structure with protein on the outside and RNA on the inside. And this kind of non-enveloped helical capsid is very frequent in plant viruses. Now in DNA viruses, uh, DNA, animal viruses, you only find helical capsids in envelope viruses. So you have this kind of thing like this. This is Ebola virus. You can see it's a, you know, filamentous uh, helical capsid, but it's got an envelope. Uh, this thing is measles virus. So it's kind of got a, the envelope forms a bag here and on the inside you have a helical capsid. It's a very simple system. It works to protect the genome. But there's a bit of a problem here, especially for non-enveloped capsids. Now imagine your virus and uh, uh, in order to infect cells more efficiently, it would be advantageous to increase the size of the genome by adding a few extra genes to undermine the host cell defenses. So the genome is going to have a tendency to expand and get longer to incorporate new functions. But the problem is, the longer the genome is, the longer the capsid is, the, is going to be. So a particle like this is maybe only like eight nanometers in diameter, but it can be already like a couple of hundred nanometers long. And once you start having a particle like this, it's becoming like more than 300, 400, 500 nanometers long, it starts to become physically unstable. So this type of capsid architecture puts a limit on the genome size. So is there another solution to packaging up the virus genome and protecting it? Well, yes. So the idea here is that we don't think of the genome as a linear molecule just stretched out in two dimensions as a line. You can roll it up in three dimensions, like a ball of wool. So that's basically the idea for icosahedral symmetry. So you're going to form, the proteins of the capsid are going to form a ball that is hollow and the genome of the virus is going to be rolled up inside. And that way you could have a bigger genome but the particle size stays very small and very stable. Now the simplest way to get proteins interacting together to form some kind of hollow ball is if you've got 60 copies of a protein and three copies of the protein will make up a triangular face and 20 faces will make up an icosahedron and that's why this is called icosahedral symmetry. Okay, so in, in reality the form is more like a sphere, but you see, if you think about it in kind of like a mathematical geometric way, then 
what is happening is the, the proteins are forming you know, triangular faces and you have 20 triangular faces, it makes an icosahedron. That's why it's called icosahedral symmetry. Now, 60 copies of the same protein kind of works, but you can't get a particle bigger than 20 to 30 nanometers diameter maximum. So if for viruses that have bigger capsids, then the architecture has to be more complex, more proteins involved, and then you get bigger, pro bigger capsid. So large capsids like this, you can have a genome more than 100 kilobases in size. Okay. Right, so what are the basic functions of the different structural proteins in the virus? So I'm just going to have a little bit of a recap here. So for the capsid, the fundamental function is to protect the virus genome. For naked viruses, the capsid proteins are also essential for interacting with host cell proteins that are, and, uh, that are necessary for attachment and entry into the host cell. Now, just to try and illustrate this. Okay, so imagine you've got some kind of uh, icosahedral naked virus like this. At some point, it's going to need to attach to a receptor on the host cell. So there's a direct interaction between the capsid proteins and the receptor. What happens when you've got an envelope virus? Here's the lipid bilayer of the envelope. The capsid doesn't have any access to the receptor. So that means Envelope like uh, enveloped viruses have all got to code for at least one surface glycoprotein. And the function of this envelope glycoprotein is to interact with receptors on the host cell and allow the virus to attach and enter the host. Okay, so that's what you can see here. So again, for rhabdoviruses, you've got a nuclear capsid in the middle. You've got an envelope with a glycoprotein on the envelope, it's true here, and sometimes you've got another protein that's kind of in between, in between the envelope and the nuclear capsid. So those are called matrix or tegument proteins. And there are two functions. They can either have a structural role, so that's true for uh, uh, the matrix proteins of rhabdoviruses. They form a physical link between the envelope and the nuclear capsid. So it's holding the whole thing together. And tegument proteins, one of their roles can be to target the host cell before gene expression occurs. So one of the early events when the virus infects a cell is membrane fusion like this. An envelope virus will have to fuse its envelope with the cell membrane, and then the capsid can enter the infected cell. So if you've got tegument proteins like this, they can get into the infected cell as well and start screwing around with whatever the cell is doing to try and avoid being infected. Okay, So that's another role of these proteins that are in between the capsid and the envelope. Okay, so I I think that's about time to have a little break. So this is the summary so far, what viruses are, what the basic techniques in virology are, and the basic elements of capsid structure. So here's a little question for you to see if you've been following. <coughs> Let me just open this up. Okay, start. Has it started? Maybe. Now start. Ah, okay, yeah, should be started now.
Yeah. Okay, so we've got a few answers here. I think it's pretty interesting. Okay, so what do we have? So, so that's what I've got so far. Okay, one, all envelope viruses have at least one glyco envelope glycoprotein. That's true, definitely true. It's required for attachment and entry to the host cell. Uh, the main function of the capsid is to protect the virus genome. Also true. That's good. Virus capsids are composed either of polysaccharide or of polypeptide. That's false. Virus capsids are always protein. And the reason I, I put this question in here is because it's very easy to mix up these two things. Okay. The capsid of a virus or the capsule of a bacterium. Because the words sound similar, but in fact they're very, very different. So the capsule antigens can be polysaccharide or polypeptide, but the virus capsid is always protein. So that, that's why this question is in here. Okay? So two is false. Four, okay, naked viruses are more resistant to detergents than envelope viruses. So most people say this is, or don't believe this is true, but in fact it is true, okay? This is correct. And that's because envelope viruses, the envelope is lipid, it's a lipid bilayer. So it can be dissolved by a detergent. Now you might say, yeah, but you still have the capsid in the middle. That's, it's still, it's not really destroyed. But in fact, if you dissolve the envelope, you remove the envelope glycoproteins. So the capsid on its own can't affect anything anymore. So it's been inactivated. Now that is very, very important when it comes to defining effective control measures. So the coronavirus, it's an envelope virus. It's susceptible just to basic hand washing and to disinfect surfaces, you know, wash them down with a bit of ethanol, it will be very effective. Similar for influenza virus. But other viruses like um, um, rotaviruses, which co cause childhood diarrhea, they are very, very difficult to inactivate. These are small, naked viruses, no envelope, just a protein capsid, and it's more stable and more difficult to inactivate. Okay, question five, viruses are not living organisms. I don't know if there's a real answer to this question, but it's kind of interesting that you can even wonder about this, okay, you know? So I suppose, the argument to say yes they're alive is because they can replicate 
And the argument for saying, no, they're not alive is, well, they're not really any different compared to a plasmid. Would you say plasmid DNA is alive in bacteria? Most people would probably say no. And uh, vi there seems to be a continuum, at least for some virus families, between mobile DNA elements and viruses. Uh, so it's difficult to really say that, you know, and if you look at things that way, then viruses are what? They're just a kind of like fancy plasmid that's got some proteins and then manages to move around. Okay, so let's get back to this because we have to try and move on. So now, now we're going to go on to the second part of the lecture. Yeah, I think we're still okay for time. And we are going to talk about bacteriophages. So bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. And they were discovered just a bit more than 100 years ago, independently by a British microbiologist called Frédéric Twart, and uh, perhaps more famous in France, uh, Félix Derrel, who was a French-Canadian. Now, basic things you need to know is that you can count the number of infectious bacteriophages with a plaque assay. So, when you want to count bacteria, you spread the bacteria on an agar plate. And it works because the bacteria can use the agar to grow, okay? Use the... Uh, peptones and the yeast extract to, 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 to grow. So bacteriophage, they don't eat peptones, they don't eat glucose. They eat bacteria. It's in the name, right? Bacteriophage. It eats bacteria. So if you want to grow bacteriophage, you spread them on a plate that has got something they like to eat. That is bacteria. Okay, so you you make up your agar plate with a load of bacteria in it, and then you spread the bacteriophage. And if you have a series of dilutions, then you'll have one plaque corresponds to one infectious virus particle. So you can start counting them and purifying them. It's very, very good. So if you pick out one of these plaques, this contains the progeny virus from one infectious particle. So this is a kind of like a pure culture. In bacteriology, it's very important to start from one colony. In virology, it has been very important to get purified virus from one plaque. Now, bacteriophage was the first type of virus that anybody could study in any detail. And they were very important in molecular biology because they were the simplest type of replicating biological entity. Okay. So they were important for demonstrating that DNA is the genetic material, not protein, and uh, demonstrating the triplet nature of the genetic code. This was done with a series of mutants in uh, bacteriophage initially. So a very important model organism. Okay, so what do they look like? Well, most bacteriophage that people work with or will, will see in an environmental sample will be tailed phages, so the caudal virales. So caudal is like a tail, right? These phages have a tail. And depending on the type of tail, they fall into three families, the myoviridae, the cifoviridae, and the podoviridae. So myoviridae, like T4 phage, they have a long contractile tail. The cifoviridae, like lambda phage, I've got a long flexible tail, like this one, which doesn't contract. And the podoviridae, like T7 phage, T7 phage rather, they have a kind of icosahedral capsid and just one, some kind of base plate attached here. So it's like a foot, okay? Not like a tail, it's like a foot on one of the vertices of the icosahedron. So, those are three main, well, the three families of the myo, of the cordo, of the virales, the tailed phages. 
and they have slightly different biologies, okay? So uh, myoviridae and podoviridae are generally lytic. So later on, we'll see what lysogeny is, but just bear in mind for the minute that myoviridae and podoviridae are basically lytic and cephoviridae can frequently enter lysogeny. And in terms of host specificity, podoviridae are very, very strictly adapted to a single host. Uh, myoviridae tend to be able to infect and kill different species of bacteria, so they have a broad host specificity, and cephoviridae are somewhere in between. So most bacteriophage look like this, and these are phage which have double-stranded genomes, double-stranded linear DNA inside the capsid. Icosahedral head, long or very, very short, helical tail, non-enveloped. Okay. Okay, so those are, in fact, the most frequent types of bacteriophage, but there are other types of morphology. So once you look, you can see that you have, you know, uh, some kind of filamentous phage like this, non-enveloped helical nuclear helical capsid. You have some phage that have a, just an icosahedral uh, capsid. And there are also some enveloped bacteriophages. Now, uh, with very, very strange morphology, morphologies, and these are weird bacteriophage that grow at a very low pH and at temperatures, you know, above 80 degrees centigrade. So sulfolobus, this is an extremophile archaea. So even in condi environmental conditions that are very, very harsh, there are some viruses that can still grow in a, you know, hot springs at pH 2 or something like that. So they have very, very unusual morphologies. So it's just to show that, in fact, you know, most people, when you talk about bacteriophage, you think about something like this. And then there are other things out there, okay? And we know a lot more about the biology of these types of viruses than we know about these guys. Okay, so once you look carefully, you can find bacteria, many species of bacteriophage that infect the same species of bacterium. So just looking at Escherichia coli, the T even phages, so T2, T4, T6, they're very, very similar. So I don't know if they, you can say they're different species, maybe yes. And the T odd family, you know, uh, several species, and then the Cifoviridae, uh, filamentous phage, and then icosahedral naked phages. So you've got easily 10 or 20 different species of phage inspecting one species of bacterium. And then once you start looking, you can find bacteriophage that infect all types of bacteria. You have phage that infect gram-negatives, gram-positives, mycobacteria, and archaeobacteria. So phages are everywhere. So you have a lot of diversity in bacteriophages, probably more than you have, you know, in uh, microbial bacterial genomes. Okay, so I've got a few questions here just to try and illustrate how many viruses and phages exist in the biosphere. So just think about the oceans, okay? So uh, probably it's a little bit late in the year, but if you go down to Pornic and go swim around in the sea, and if you're a bit unlucky, you might uh, swallow a mouthful of seawater. So even though uh, the water at the beach is very, very clean, there will be a whole bunch of bacteriophage in that sample. So my question here is, you know, how many bacteriophage will you have in one ml of seawater? Okay, think about it. Okay, and then we'll just go through this by a show of hands, okay? So, okay, everybody ready to express an opinion here? Yeah? Okay, who says one? One per ml. 
There's like almost nothing out there. Who says 100 per mil? It was at 10,000 per mil. A couple of people, 1 million per mil. More people, 100 million per mil. Okay, so you're kind of like around here. Most people are like, it starts off here and then most people here and a few people. That's about right, okay? So out in the deep ocean, you might have 1 to 3 million per mil. Uh, the coastal site is going to be way more. Like down at the beach, you might be more like 100 million per mil because the, the environment is richer, you have more microbes, you have more bacteriophage. But for, you know, the most of the ocean, one million per ml. Okay, so the oceans are pretty big. So how many bacteriophage are there going to be in the whole of the world's oceans? Okay, just look at those numbers for a second. Ready to guess? Who says we got 10 to the 10 in the whole of the world's oceans? No way, it's way too small, right? 10 to the 20. Now, 10 to the 30. A few people, 10 to the 40. Wow, 10 to, no way, 10 to the 40 is a ridiculously huge number. It's actually, it's more like 10 to the 30. All right, so uh, th this is part of the problem here. I mean, I, I can kind of visualize maybe a million. You think about money, maybe you think about a billion euros or something. Already it's starting to become difficult to gradually visualize this stuff, but 10 to the 20, 10 to the 30, 10 to the 40. I mean, can't, I can't really imagine how much that is. So, you know, if you were trying to imagine the weight of all these bacteria fate, right? So each one of them, they're pretty small. So there's only about 0.2 femtograms of carbon in a single virus particle. So we know that there are 10 to the 30 of them, so it's pretty easy to calculate how many, how many kilograms that makes, but just to make it more fun, so how many blue whale equivalents is that? <laughs> all right, so if you put all the viruses together, that'll be the equivalent of carbon of how many blue whales, all right? Okay, who says one? The blue whale is massive, right? Okay. Because like a hundred blue whales. A couple of people. Who says 10,000 blue whales? A few more. A million blue whales. Nobody. A hundred million blue whales. So most of you are thinking it's around about, it's something like 70 million blue whales equivalent of carbon. Yeah, it's about 70 million. So this is a huge amount of biomass out there in the ecosystem. So bacteriophages are the second biggest sink of carbon in the whole of the marine ecosystem. Number one is bacteria, prokaryotes. Number two is bacteriophages. And then you probably have, you know, what well, are microscopic and marine organisms and then like the visible stuff as with a smaller amount. So, you know, this is a massive amount of carbon in, in bacteriophages. So if you like strung them all together, how long would they be? Okay. Uh, so each one you think is about 100 nanometers long. So, uh, you know, would that be 1 million kilometers, 1 light year, 1,000 light years, 10 million light years, or a billion light years? Okay. 1 million kilometers. Who says that? Bit short. Okay. 1 light year. Uh, yeah, that's pretty far, isn't it? 1,000 light years. 10 million light years. Oh, and a, a billion light years. It's 10 million, apparently. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah, 1,000, sorry. I misread. So the actual answer, apparently, is 10 million light years. So that's further than the nearest galaxy, right? I think. <laughs> okay, so so there, there there are really tons of these guys out there, right? And they they and they have an important role in carbon and nitrogen cycles. I wasn't really planning to to talk about this, but 
if you think about a kind of trophic web in a marine ecosystem, basically you think about your primary producers, which are going to be like, uh, um, uh, you know, cyanobacteria. So these guys are photosynthesizing, they fix carbon. Okay, it's going like this and they get eaten by something and they get eaten by something else and then at the top you've got like a big shark or something like that. Okay, uh, so you're going to have some kind of fish around here. And then they die and they come down to the bottom of the sea and they get, you know, uh, uh, turned into some kind of like uh, fermentation products and you'll get some kind of organic carbon. Okay, and the organic carbon can be eaten by bacteria again. So you're going to have this kind of cycling effect like this. So you're going to have the, the, the primary production here and then you know, bacteria getting eaten by bigger organisms and then some of the carbon gets recycled by, uh, you know, after you die, you know, comes back. Now, what are bacteriophage doing here? Well, bacteriophage will be infecting these bacteria, the cyanobacteria here and the first heterotrophs, and lysing those bacteria and incorporating it into bacteriophage. So, in fact, you'll have some of the carbon which is being recycled and some of it is going to become organic carbon. So the bacterium that's been killed by a, a phage is going to be exploding and releasing some organic carbon, which is available. This bacteriophage, if it can't infect a bacterium, it's just a piece of protein floating around. It can get eaten by bacteria. Okay. So in fact, what is happening here is the net effect is a lot of the organic carbon in the microbiome is being just recycled through lytic bacteriophage and less is available for the higher trophic layers. So this is a kind of like the organic carbon, nitrogen, sulfur shunt through bacteriophage. Okay, so that's bacteriophage in ecology. And we're and we just starting to really understand the impact of bacteriophage on, 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 on these aspects of microbiology. Okay, so to get back to something more fundamental, okay, so earlier on I talked about how bacteriophage or viruses do not replicate by binary fission. And the first indications that viral growth or bacterial growth or bacteriophage growth rather, viral growth or growth or bacteriophage growth is fundamentally different to what you see in bacteria, came from experience, experiments on bacteriophage performed in 1939, Ellis and Delbruck. And what they were trying to do was determine the different growth phases of a bacteriophage, just like other microbiologists had done for bacteria. So the idea is you infect a bacterial culture with phage and then take samples out at different times and then tie to the phage by the plaque assay. So at different times you've got these kind of curves which are uh, taken from you know the original paper about 80 years ago now. Okay so the plaque assay, how does this work? So it's just like what you're going to do for bacteria, except so you start out by preparing a series of dilutions and then you inoculate 0.1 ml of each dilution into bacteria and soft agar. So you start out with your six plates and you put them in the incubator overnight and then the next day what you'll see is where it's really, really dilute, you don't have any infectious phage anywhere, so the bacteria, they just grow everywhere. When it's not very dilute, uh, all of the bacteria get infected, they all get lysed, so the whole thing is clear. And then at some point, you'll have a number of these plaques that you can count. 
So, you know, this is 83 planks on the plate with a 10 to the 3 fold dilution. So that means you have 8.3 times 10 to the 5 PFU per ml, plaque forming units. Okay, so for bacteria, you spread them out and you get colonies. So you get colony forming units. Viruses, bacteriophage, you measure them in plaque forming units. So this works very well for bacteriophage and other viruses that, gi that give you a lytic infection and that where you have a good cell culture model. Now to understand what happens next, you have to be able to answer this question. And I have to be able to activate the question, right? Okay, come back. Come back over here. Okay, it's gone, it's started. Okay, let's have a look at the answers because it's pretty. Okay, so here's what the answers are so far. Pretty evenly split. So we're talking about like basically two or three is what people say, right? Okay, so no real consensus here. So another way to, to ask the same question is to think about it. Okay, so you've got something like this. Right, here, here we've got like four free bacteriophage. And here I have one infected bacterium. So if I get this in my sample and I spread it on the agar plate, how many plaques would that form? Uh, so who says this would give us four plaques? This is the part where you put your hands up if you think it's right. Okay, who says this will give us five plaques? Still nobody. Who says this will give us eight plaques on the agar plate? Okay, nobody's putting their hand up at all here. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand the question. This, I, I'm saying that this, this is what you have in the sample, right? And if you could see a situation like this, you have a plate here and you have eight plaques. So that's what you can see with your eye, but that's after one night of culture. So the phage has been replicating and it can 
kill all the bacteria that have been near it. So that's why it's like a zone where you've killed all the bacteria. It's a plaque, a lysis plaque. But at the beginning, this was one infectious phage that just fell on the bacteria down there and started infecting them and killing them. And the question is, do you get a plaque only with, an, with a free phage or with an infected bacterium or with like a... So, so, so that's why I'm asking you here, how many plaques could this give? So we got like one, two, three, four free phage, one infected bacterium with some bacteriophage in the middle. Does it? Yeah. Ah, uh, no, okay, good question. Thank you for asking that question, which was, what actually is a plaque? Do you mean a colony? No, I mean these things that you can see here. Can you see this, you guys, when I'm pointing at this? Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> okay. This one down here, this is entirely uniform. This is just bacteria growing everywhere, okay? You can see this clear point here, right? That is a plaque. It's a hole in the lawn of bacteria. And this is a zone, if you looked at it under the microscope, you would see all the bacterial cells are dead, they've been lysed. All the bacteria have been killed inside the plaque. What has happened is, let me try and draw this. So you've got your kind of agar here, and you've got a load of bacteria everywhere. Yeah, excuse me why I, I just draw every single of these many millions of bacteria on the wall here. Yeah. Right, okay. So you've got bacteria all the way. So at some point you'll have like a phage, which is going to infect one of these cells. That's what happens at time zero when you set this up. Now what happens afterwards? Once this cell is infected, it's going to be lysed, it will release other phage nearby and they'll infect the nearby cells. And they'll all explode as well. And afterward, after an overnight culture, that's why you can see this zone. Whereas all the other bacteria that are not infected, they just carry on growing and it becomes turbid. Okay, so that's what you can see here. So one plaque is an area in the agar where all the bacteria have been killed. But initially, it was just one phage infecting one bacterial cell here. Okay, thank you for that question, because that's why probably no one could understand this part. <laughs> okay, so the question is, if you've got like far four free bacteriophage and one infected bacterium in the sample, how many plaques would that give you? Does everybody understand the question? Can you please tell me if you understand the question? Okay, good. So, who says it will give four plaques? Nobody. Who says it will give five plaques? Yeah. Who says it will give eight plaques? Okay, good. Five is the right answer. Five. Because when this falls on the agar, it's just going to release phage locally. So it's just going to be the same thing as if you had one virus, one phage infecting the cell. So you have like an infected cell first, and then it's only going to release its phage locally. So it will give you one plaque. So this guy gives one plaque, a free, doesn't matter how many are inside. Okay, it will just give you one plaque. So that means answer three is correct. Okay, that's the correct answer here. Okay. Yeah, so we have eight minutes. We'll just go through the next couple of slides and we'll stop after that. Okay, so I think it was useful to spend the time on this, just hopefully so everybody can be clear on this. Right. So this is, this is kind of 
the interpretation of the bacteriophage lytic growth curve. This was what was found in the Ellis and Delbruck experiments, is that, okay, you always have a latent phase. The titer just seems to stay very stable, and then suddenly it goes up, and then it reaches a plateau. So you have a latent phase and then a release phase. And the idea initially was that, okay, so first you've got the virus, the bacteriophage, it infects the cell, and then later on it's going to uh, uh, replicate inside the bacterium. So you have more phage, but they're still inside, so this is one plaque, this will give one plaque. So that's why the curve stays flat. And then after a certain amount of time, the infected cells, they burst, they are lysed, and very, very quickly, it releases a lot of free phage, so you get this big jump in the titer. And then you have the plateau because there's no more cells around to infect, so they don't grow anymore. They just go through one lytic cycle. So that's the basic idea. Now, what you might want to do is, is it possible to count the phage inside the infected cell to test this idea? And in fact, it is possible to do this because these bacteriophage, they're myoviridae, tailed phages, non-enveloped capsid that resist detergents and uh, solvents. Whereas the bacteria, they are E. coli, they are gram-negative with a cell wall very rich in lipids. So what you can do is you can treat the sample with chloroform before you spread it out on the agar plate. This will lyse the infected cells and release the bacteriophage. So you can count how the virus particles that are inside the bacterium. And if you do that, okay, in the dotted line, this is the curve that we saw before, but in the red line, this is the results you get if you treat the infected bacteria with chloroform before you spread them out on the agar plates. And the big surprise here is what's called the eclipse phase. Very soon after the infection, there are no plaques at all. So that's a surprise. So what does that mean? That means that the bacteriophage just seems to disappear. It doesn't exist anymore after the infection. All you have is an infected cell. So you don't actually have the phage that goes into the bacterium. Just the DNA goes inside. And afterwards, you get the formation of new virus particles. So here, this is why the curve comes up earlier. So you do have an accumulation of phage inside the infected bacterium. And then finally, they're released. So this is the big surprise with this experiment, the observation that just after the infection, you have an eclipse phase and the bacteriophage doesn't really exist. So you can see this by electron microscopy. So at the beginning of the infection, the bacteriophage or the virus is still visible. So here the examples are from a chlorella virus because the particles are bigger. Oh, if it actually wants to... Oh, come on, man, you're supposed to... Yeah, there it is, okay. So here's the virus particle. It's gonna to bind to the cell wall of the chlorella. So it binds, it starts to degrade the cell wall. And what happens is, well, you know, the DNA inside the virus is going to be injected into the infected cell. So that's why you don't have a virus anymore. A virus is a genome plus the capsid. After this phase, you've got the capsid is stuck on the outside and you just have the infected cell. And then you have the eclipse phase. Virus genes are expressed, the genome is replicated, and then you start to have new virus particles assemble inside the host, and they get more and more numerous, and then in the end, you know, the host cell is destroyed and they're released. Okay, so you can see these basic steps of the virus replication cycle. So this kind of experiment was really the first step to understanding how viruses replicate. It's true for bacteriophage, and it's true for every different type of virus. So all viruses have got to go through these different steps in the replication cycle. 
starts by the attachment through to a specific receptor, entry into the infected cell. Then at some point, the genome's got to be released. This is called decapsidation. Afterwards, the genome's replicated. Viral genes are expressed. And then they're put together like a kind of set of some kind of model. And finally, these particles have got to be released. So every virus has got to go through all of these steps. And if you can block them with some kind of drug, then you have an antiviral medication. So President Trump, he got antiviral medication, right? So he got two things. Everybody been reading up on the news? So what did President Trump get very, very quickly, faster than probably 99.9% .9 of other patients would get? Yeah. Remdesivir, number one. So remdesivir is a small molecule inhibitor of the RNA polymerase of the virus genome. So it's going to block this step, the genome replication step, okay? So remdesivir is blocking here. Number one. Number two, what did he get? Nobody followed this? Anybody get this? He got a cocktail of two monoclonal antibodies that are currently in clinical trials with very promising early results. So the monoclonal antibodies, what are they going to do? They're going to bind on the surface of the capsid here and prevent the interaction with the receptor. They're neutralizing antibodies. That's what neutralizing means. It's going to block the very first step in the infection. So President Trump, he got an association of two effective antiviral therapies, one that is acting on this attachment step and one that is acting on what happens inside the infected cells. And probably this association is going to turn out to be very effective. It's not because it one person uh, had a very favorable outcome. But, you know, if this, if this is trialed, I think in a couple of months, we might find that this is a very effective therapy against the virus. Okay, so I think that's probably a good place for me to stop. We'll pick up again from here next week. And don't forget, microbe of the week, this evening, 7 p.m. If I forget, please email me or text me. <laughs>